We reject the ideology of globalism and we embrace the doctrine of patriotism. Not only will this tax plan pay for itself, but it will pay down debt. There are moral and legal obligation questions that I think we'll have to wrestle with as a society. When we as people go wobbly on the truth, we go wobbly on America. All you have to do is look at the numbers, look at what we've done. And this is all in the beginning. From 100.9 FM WXIR, this is Evidence of Design, and I'm your host, Jason Taylor. Got it. Evidence of Design is a live talk show about the political economy. We critique income and wealth inequality and support democratic values. Thank you for listening, and welcome. Good morning, everyone. Happy Saturday morning. Yes, good morning everyone. Happy Saturday. It is Saturday, August 3rd here in Rochester, New York. You're tuned in to 100.9 FM WXIR. Perhaps you're tuned in on the radio dial or you're tuned in on the TuneIn app or online at www.1009wxir.com. Regardless of how you're here, thanks for being here. This is is Evidence of Design, and this is episode 61 of Evidence of Design. I'm your host, Jason Taylor, joined by my good friends and co-hosts, Matt Treadwell. Hello. And Mary Lawrence. Good morning. For those new to Evidence of Design, we talk about income and wealth inequality on the show. We critique the reasons and the causes for income and wealth inequality, and we try to investigate why is there so much of it in society and what can we do about our society to make it more egalitarian and more equal? If you don't understand how the political economy works in that fancy term, then what's likely going to happen is those who are in power and have a lot of wealth are going to be able to take advantage of you because they're able to manipulate the way that you think about the world and how the economy works. So this show is to be like, yeah, how can we critique income and wealth inequality, and think about how to make society better. That's what we do here. Thank you to the Afrocentric Show to putting on a good show before this. We will be with you for the next hour until 12 p.m. here talking about the second Democratic presidential primary debate for the 2020 campaign season that happened this week in Chicago. For those who may have caught it, it was on Tuesday of July 30th this week, and it was also on Wednesday of July 31st. There were two nights of debates with 20 candidates on stage. We previously covered the first Democratic presidential primary debates that happened around a month ago, and now we're taking a look at the second round of those debates. There are 24-ish candidates in the running. One dropped out, Eric Swalwell. Another one came in. So we are in a full cycle heel of having a lot of candidates run for office. So there were, again, two nights of debates, and the DNC, the Democratic National Committee, they're the ones who kind of put together how the debates look and the structures behind them. And we'll be talking about those today because it is important, I think, to kind of stay tuned throughout this campaign season. I don't agree with the fact that our uh, elections in the United States are like two years long. You know, for folks who are in the House of Representatives, they are essentially always in campaign mode. And I think that is harmful to our democracy. However, for for the office of the presidency, of course, the president is elected every four years. We kind of have a campaign season in the U.S. where it takes about a two years where uh, candidates running for president usually campaign for. So that's a, a two-year presidential campaign cycle, which means it happens like half of the time, <laughs> half of the time, all the time. And and that can be really harmful. We get over we get over politicked, as you might say. And, uh, you know, that, that can be tough. So I, I'm, I'm saying that, listeners, because I'm, I'm approaching this with not attempting to, like, glorify the political season and turn it into a, a sports arena. You know, it, it's very harmful, I think, to turn politics into, like, a game of sports. And, and 
in our covering of these debates. We hope that if you did not tune into them, we'll just be providing some interesting highlights and analysis so that you can walk away sort of just being more informed about where our politics stands. Because, of course, right now, our politics, it's very important to be involved and stay informed. And so we are here to hopefully help you do that, not to glorify or give you any top 10 or top 5 lists. That is not our objective. And we would love to have you participate in this discussion, of course. We're here for you live August 3rd, unless you're on a different time zone or planet, August 3rd is the name of the game. You're listening to us live. Give us a ring, 585-219-8889. Again, that is 585-219-8889. We're here for you live, and you can give us an email, radioeod at gmail.com. That's radioeod at gmail.com, or Facebook, or Twitter, at Radio E. O D. We'd love to hear from you. Politics is all about participation. Let's participate. Oh yeah. <clears throat> Charlotte Gainsbourg, Out of Touch. And this is Evidence of Design on 100.9 FM WXIR. Thanks for tuning in. Let's talk about the second Democratic presidential primary debates that happened this week. Again, there are like 24 candidates in the race. This Tuesday was the first night of the second round of the debates. Ten candidates on stage. Marianne Williamson, who's an author. Ohio Representative Tim Ryan. Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar. The mayor of South Bend, Indiana, Pete Buttigieg, Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders, the senator from Massachusetts, Elizabeth Warren, former Texas Representative Beto O'Rourke, former governor of Colorado, John Hickenlooper, former Maryland House Representatives member, John Delaney, and lastly, his first debut on the debate stage, Montana Governor Steve Bullock. All members of the Democratic Party, well, you could argue Sanders is not, but he is for the purposes of, of these debates, and they were all on stage hashing it out. On the second night, Wednesday, July 31st, we had Colorado Senator Michael Bennett, New York Senator Kristen Gillibrand, former House of, uh, Housing Secretary Julian, Julian Castro, New Jersey Senator Cory Booker, former Vice President Joe Biden, California Senator Kamala Harris, uh, tech entrepreneur and, um, Andrew Yang, Hawaii Representative Tulsi Gabbard, Washington Governor Jay Inslee, and New York Mayor Bill de Blasio. So you wrote those down, listeners. You got them all in your brain. Well, they, those were not all the candidates. Four actually are running but did not make the debate stage. That's Massachusetts Representative Seth Moulton, gov- or, uh, Mayor of Miramar, Florida, Wayne Messam, former Pennsylvania rep Joe Sestak and billionaire executive 
Tom Steyer. There's the list. And remind us really quickly, what does it take to get on the debate stage for these candidates? Good question, Mary. We I, I mentioned it in the past shows. I don't have that in front of me. You need to get two things. A, a certain percentage on X number of national polls to be eligible to participate in a debate. So you got to prove, hey, look, at least these amount of people support me on a poll. And you also got to prove hey, look, I have X number of people donating to my campaign. So I don't know the exact numbers. I do have them for the third debate. There is an upcoming debate September 12th and potentially September 13th, depending on how many candidates make it in. Those are the third Democratic 2020 presidential primaries. And to qualify for those debates, you need to have at least two, you need to score at least 2% on four national polls, and you also need to have at least 130,000 unique donors and 400 unique donors in at least 20 states. So that's kind of the criteria that the DNC has laid out to qualify to participate in these debates. So far, I believe there are eight candidates who have qualified for them in September. Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Kamala Harris, Pete Buttigieg, Beto O'Rourke, Cory Booker, and Amy Klobuchar. So we just listed out a whole bunch of names for you folks. And why we're doing that is just to kind of get uh, your, your mind around the playing field here. Let us talk about the debates at large, though. Matt, I know that last time we covered these, we were talking about sort of the merits or the, or the cons of actually talking about a debate format. Did you feel, Matt, like a, a similar sort of uh, a feeling from watching the debates? I know last time we talked about a couple of things that, that are problematic with these debates. Did you still feel that coming out of watching these? Yeah, I mean, I think that these debates were very redundant um, in the sense that at least with the first debates, while they didn't really serve as a as any real um, sort of uh, facilitation of of um, in-depth dialogue on specific policy proposals that these people might, that these candidates might have, they were at the very least a good introduction, I suppose, for a lot of the candidates, many of whom I had no familiarity with. But this time around, it felt like much of the same structure, just an hour longer with very little time given to any sort of, as I said earlier, actual or in-depth dialogue on what these people, what, what these candidates' plans are if they uh, secure the office of the presidency. And I just found myself asking, you know, what's the point? Haven't we watched this already? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we talked a lot about how debates can be really tricky because you want to know actually what politicians stand for and, and in the debate format, especially when you have 10 people on, this, on the stage at the same time who can only talk for like 60 seconds of allotted time, it can be really hard to know what folks stand for. And really the best way to do that is to either read a lot of secondary coverage like New York Times, NPR, Politico, 538, wherever you feel like you get your news from that's reliable, there's, there's that way to do that. Or you could actually, of course, follow the politicians on Facebook and Twitter or other forums. Just follow them, keep up to date with them, subscribe to their uh, RSS feed or something through their actual, um, if, they, they're, if they're already a member of like, you know, the House of Reps or the Senate, then you can subscribe to those feeds. Or you can also try to actually read their campaign websites. And this is where you're probably going to get most of the information from, yes. is if you look up any of those candidates, they're going to have a website. And ideally, the website is going to have a lot of information about their specific policy proposals in depth. Now, that inform again, we're a year and a half out of the actual election night of Trump versus ex-Democrat, right? So those things might change over time, and they might still be in development. For example, this week, Kamala Harris just unveiled her her healthcare plan, and that was a big deal and, you know, robust and, and, and all the rest of it. And so these things will sort of come out over time. But that is a great place to get that information from because you're hearing directly from the candidates themselves with the specifics, talking about numbers, dollars, policies, proposals, provisions. It also gives you an idea of, like, what their current position is, you know, uh, and what their qualifications might be um, and what their history of voting. I, I know a lot of candidate websites have, like, the all of uh, a list of all of the bills that they have voted on um so you can have an idea of where they've st stood on issues in the past right 
And so the tricky thing is that we're, we're sort of caught in this space where it's like you want the easy access to information, so then you get a debate, and then you leave watching the debate being like, I still don't know what they stand for. I'm still confused about these issues. And so, again, the point is, like, living in democracy, it's hard. We're all busy people, and it's unfortunate that we're so busy given how our political economy works, but it does require us to do some homework. Yeah, and I should say that uh, on reflection, thinking about just sort of the way in which these debates began, the sort of, um, uh, I guess, build up or trailers that played before the yes. before the beginning. It, it I shouldn't be surprised that these debates uh, were particularly geared towards just generating spectacle. Mm-hmm. And I think that. Um, I remember last time we talked about the debates um, back in June. We we mentioned we brought up like pathos versus mm-hmm. logos, and I think that that is deliberate. I think that these are uh, supposed to be, um, or at least viewed by many of the candidates as their opportunity to sort of make this rousing emotional connection, which I think. A few people outside of perhaps Kamala Harris and Bernie Sanders are mm-hmm. capable of doing. So I'm hearing from you, Matt, that like you know these debates are being hosted and covered by like CNN, the most recent example, and then before it was NBC, and uh, upcoming debates, the so third debates are ABC. The, these news organizations, you know, are for-profit companies who make a ton of money off of getting people to hooked on watching their their shows and then they you know run advertisements and make money off of that way and so there's an incentive for these news companies to uh, to push for pathos meaning push for emotion and politicians know this and therefore they're going to try to make those snippy one-liners etc or, or or to become a meme and they can become viral well that's what we saw with kamala harris in the in the previous debates where she took on joe biden on busing and she saw a huge increase in her numbers right and so as I as I started out the show, you're not going to get that from us here on Evidence of Design. We're going to talk about different things, not snippy or snappy, you know, top five or, or, or headlines. We're going to we're going to sort of go into more of a theoretical or philosophical approach to these debates. And we do want you to participate on 100.9 FM WXIR. Give us a ring, 585-219-8889. That's 585-219-8889. Nine. Did you watch the debates? Did you not watch the debates? What's striking you about the current political landscape right now in the 2020 Democratic presidential primaries? We want to hear from you, 585-219-8889, or email us radioeod at gmail.com. Matt, Mary, I want to jump off first with a kind of a, a larger, a bigger picture idea. And this is that if you're listening right now in Rochester or whatever, listeners, and you're like, you know, I, I don't really care about politics. I don't really have enough time to think about these things or, oh, my God, I just want it to be over. I just want someone to beat Trump or or, or whatever, whatever point of view you have, you know, and that's fine. I just want to say that there, there are a lot of people out there that I talk to who say that they're not political or they don't care about politics. And so I want to, you know, use my 60 seconds of a soapbox here to kind of make a metaphor for you. So I, um, you know, for those folks who might think that they're apolitical or they don't care about politics or they're bothered by something and they just are totally tuned out from it. uh, Mary, you did something great for me this past week or so, and you brought me to yoga. It was my first yoga experience. It was pretty cool, I must say. And if I'm going to be honest with you, I had like a lot of stereotypes about yoga going into it. You know, I was like, I like to lift weights. I'm a personal trainer. What am I doing out here? Stretching, you know, moving my body when I can be lifting weights or something like that. You know, sort of these these silly uh, preconceived notions, right? Yeah, I'm really excited to hear where this is going, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had, a, I had a lot of fun doing yoga. You know, we, we did it. The experience was cool. And, and I left it being like, you know, this isn't my, like, favorite thing in the world. But, like, but I did it, and it's okay. You know, and, and it was really cool, and I'm glad for the experience. And I, and I can see how people really like to do this. Now, on the flip side, there's, like, if I were to go fishing, you know, I don't think I could ever actually enjoy fishing as a sport or as a hobby because I just don't like to harm animals, you know, in in any regard. Like, I just would feel bad about throwing the fishing line in the water 
uh, you know, sticking a squirming worm on the hook and then having a fish bite the hook and gouge it through their mouth. And then you reel them up above air and they're suffocating. Like that to me is problematic. And I can see and appreciate how people sort of like to fish or that they could find fishing as a hobby. But for me, I don't think I will ever be able to actually enjoy fishing myself because I'm so opposed to it on a number of regards. And so if we're here, if we're along with me on this perhaps poorly conceived metaphor <laughs> is that, you know, yoga to me was something that like, I don't see how you could truly hate because it affronts you as an individual. Whereas fishing, I could see how it's something, at least for me, that like I could never be okay with because of some of the values and identities that I have. And so I hope politics for people is like yoga as opposed to fishing for me. I hope that if you are bothered by politics, it is something wrong with the situation through which it's been introduced to you as opposed to some core values that you have. You know, politics is fundamentally about how we ought to live in this world together. And I think that everyone wants to be participating in that discussion. And if you feel like you are outside of that discussion or if you don't like politics or if it's just a bunch of, you know, um, rich white people, which unfortunately it mainly is, then, then we have to sort of change that, you know, and, and it won't help by, by tuning out the system. And I hope that if you are convinced to try something like yoga, <laughs> you know, if you're convinced to try something out like politics with us for this hour, that it becomes more open to you and you're able to participate in a healthier way, as opposed to having it be something like fishing is to me and have it be sort of against your core values. And that's kind of my weird metaphor point here where, you know, if you're tuned out of politics, I hope that we can create a space to get you tuned in because, because we need you involved, whether or not you're going to vote the way I want you to vote or that I like to vote. Uh, we need you involved because this is how the society is going to, going to flourish going forward. How did you like yoga, Mary? <laughs> Um, I, I mean, <laughs> I did bring Almost you as much as she likes talking on the show, uh, even more actually, <laughs> but, uh, no, I mean, I've been practicing yoga for a long time, so I yeah. obviously enjoyed it. Um, and that particular, this particular class took place at the coming nature center. So it was a really special place. Nice. Um, I will say that was a, an interesting metaphor and i didn't expect where it was going but uh had a good point always think about that mary is politics like yoga or fishing remember that from the show all right um goats and soda goats <laughs> thank you yeah <laughs> okay just good so I, I got a text from a listener here saying that uh, i misspoke the debates were actually in detroit this week I, I apparently said chicago so i do apologize if if the if the second round of democratic presidential primaries were in d Detroit of this week. Let's jump into it, folks. Let's start talking about those debates. Yeah. Were they like fishing or yoga, Jason? They were more like fishing. Unfortunately, I found this time. Uh, I, I had a lot of I had a lot of problem with these second debates. I, I think Matt, like you said, they were rather redundant. Yeah. I mean, I didn't. I don't feel like I learned anything. Mm -hmm. Why do they have the debates so soon after the first ones? I feel like a month and a half isn't a whole lot of. You know, that doesn't give you a lot of ground for... I don't think it's even a month and a half. It's a month. Was it? Yeah. I know the last ones were in June. Weren't they mid-June? No, end of June. Oh. Well, it feels like a long time. Yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't feel like long enough for any positions to develop. really develop. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I don't think that there really is space to have new information. I wonder even if there's a point to having these second debates other than, as we mentioned... These for-profit news companies wanting to have air coverage. Yeah, I mean, I th I'm sure that's a huge part of it. Um, I think, personally, what I would have liked to have seen uh, in regards to having another debate so soon is just maybe focus on three hard topics so that we mm -hmm. could have gotten some more detail about them. I, I understand, again, that the purpose of these debates is likely not to have these long policy discussions. But that is what I'm interested in, and I would like to be able to, I don't know, see them actually engage in policy debates rather than just try to win points off of each other by appearing clever. Well, I think you have a point there where it's I, it's so hard to cover so many topics. I mean, I, I run into the same thing when I'm planning lessons for teaching that I am trying to cover so many more things than it's 
possible for my student to actually take in in one hour. And maybe that's an issue with these debates, too, is there's like just so much that they're trying to cover. I think that's actually a good idea. But um, let's maybe get into what they did cover. Yeah, there were a lot of things they did cover. This is only half of the topics, really. Healthcare was the premier topic that was covered in both debates for the longest amount of time. So there was healthcare, immigration, gun violence, the notion that the Democratic Party needs to elect someone to beat Trump or to elect someone who is far, far left or progressive, whatever those terms might mean. Climate change, infrastructure, the racial divide, white nationalism, reparations, the economy at large, foreign policy, and more dot, dot, dot. So to get to your point, Matt, I completely agree. These debates are, you know, two hours, three hours. They cover a ton of topics, and the substance will be stretched out. It would be very interesting to see if they covered more of a town hall-style format on just healthcare, for instance, to really hash it out. That would be pretty neat. But in the, in the system that we're working with right now, a lot of things were covered. You know, wide as an ocean, shallow as a pond is kind of what we're looking at. Mm. And so w- this second debate, though, structured something more than the first one did for me. It really outlined an ideological divide in the Democratic Party, especially on the first night of the debate where you had both Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren on stage at the same time. A lot of folks were like, uh-oh, are they going to have to go at it head-to-head and try to uh, come up and argue to voters why they should vote for one as opposed to another? It didn't really turn out that way. In fact, Sanders and Warren kind of tag-teamed each other and and built off and sort of formed a coalition on stage of those who are progressive, far left, even democratic socialist, although Elizabeth Warren wouldn't use that term and in fact has, has expressly said that she's a capitalist. Right. And so what you actually ended up happening on stage was that you saw a very strong ideological split in the Democratic Party that I thought was new from this time and important to note. There were a number of moderates on stage there, so the more moderate side of the Democratic Party, th- those folks included Steve Bullock, John Delaney, Tim Ryan, and Amy Klobuchar, and John Hickenlooper, my apologies. Joe Biden was in the second night of the debate, but I would throw him into that moderate category. And these are folks who are saying their central argument is kind of like, look, the Democratic Party cannot afford to elect someone as radical as Bernie Sanders or or as Elizabeth Warren. Voters just want a politician to care about kitchen book tables and issues, whatever that might mean. Yeah, kitchen book table issues. How many nouns can we string together? (laughs) And and voters just want a politician to go go up against Trump who is, quote, electable. Very interesting. I I would would just like to point out that all these people, aside from Joe Biden, are pulling behind Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. So it's interesting to think that the moderates think that uh, the people want a more moderate candidate when they are, in fact, losing (laughs) <laughs> right. That, that's a phenomenal argument. And this is, yeah, absolutely. So we have this like weird debate in the Democratic Party right now where it's like, we, we have to be more centrist. We have to be more centrist. But if you look at the polling numbers, you know, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren are in second and third place, respectively, right behind Joe Biden. So they are uh, winning, to some regard, these debates. And if you combined their supporters, they would be beyond Joe Biden. And so it seems like the indications that the Democratic Party or the the base, Democratic base, is fine with having more progressive or left-wing candidates who want to talk about things like a Green New Deal and Medicare for All and college or debt-free college, et cetera. And, you know, you're saying, Matt, like that's a really great point about polling. And also Hillary Clinton, by the way, was a a moderate that you could call, and she lost to Donald Trump. I was just going to bring that up, actually. It's like in the last election, we saw the quote unquote radical candidate, Mm -hmm. um, not the progressive candidate, but a radical candidate win against a more centrist candidate. Right. Yeah. And so I don't know if anything changed in four years, but. And I, I know that there are people out there who would make the argument that, you know, Hillary Clinton, um, yes, she was a moderate, but she also had a lot of baggage. What about all those emails? What about Benghazi? What about blah, 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 blah? Um, I think my point of view on that is that Hillary Clinton was perhaps the most qualified person to run for president in the past 50 or so years. If you just, if you're just looking at her record of, uh, expertise and, uh, what she has done with her life and that no matter who secures or clinches the uh, democratic nomination, people are going to bring up dirt and Mm -hmm. you're just going to have to be able to deal with that. So I don't, I don't hold to the argument that we need a moderate candidate. Yeah. 
But I, I, I want to play two clips now from the debate. The first one is from Elizabeth Warren, and this is her retort against uh, former Maryland Representative John Delaney. Very interesting. Uh, very interesting because this really highlights what we were just talking about, which is the debate between like the more moderate side of the Democrats and the sort of the more progressive or left wing side of the Democratic Party. And the context behind this is John Delaney is just finishing speaking about the fact that we as a country cannot do things like Medicare for all, et cetera, et cetera, because they're too expensive or they're not practical. And here's what Elizabeth Warren had to say against that. You know, I don't understand why anybody goes to all the trouble of running for president of the United States just to talk about what we really can't do and shouldn't fight for. <laughs> that was a very interesting clip, though. I, I think, you know, if you're going to pull a highlight, one of the highlights of the night where, where Warren is saying, why are you running, folks? Why, John Delaney, are you running for president if you're just up here to say we can't do all these things? The point is to try to fight for the future world that you want to live in. Pretty remarkable, I think. Another quote I'd like to play. This one, this time, is from uh, South Bend Mayor <laughs> Indiana. <laughs> South Bend Mayor <laughs> Indiana <laughs> Buttigieg. This, today's show is we're going <laughs> to... We're going to just say things backwards all we're, day. <laughs> we're going to have a noun fest, and we're going to just rearrange them. And it's gonna be America fun. for America for Americans. <laughs> so this is from a guy called Pete Buttigieg. Who knows where he's from? Mayor South Bend, Indiana. <laughs> this is, I, I think, a pretty good qu uh, clip to play as well, talking about, hmm, what should the Democrats be thinking about in their policies? It is time to stop worrying about what the Republicans will say. Look, yes. if, if, if it's true that if we embrace a far-left agenda, they're going to say we're a bunch of crazy socialists. If we embrace a conservative agenda, you know what we're, they're going to do? They're going to say we're a bunch of crazy socialists. So let's just stand up for the right policy, go out there and defend it. That's the policy I'm putting forward. Not because I think it's the right triangulation between Republicans here and Democrats here, because I think it's the right answer. All right, so that was South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Mayor Pete. Mayor Pete. I, I think that, for me, that that's the most important takeaway out of, out of both nights of debates right there. Uh, Mary, did, did you have a reaction to that? Um, I just, I think that that is a very uh, smart thing to say. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, I I got frustrated, especially I remember watching the first debates when that, um, I think the argument came up as like, why are we talking about policies? We need to talk about ways to defeat Trump. Uh, I think it was Marianne Williamson who brought that up uh, in that first debate. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, you sure that should be a thing to think about but that shouldn't be the thing that narrates your policies like the thing that narrates your policies should be you uh truly believing that that is the right answer you know with context from what other nations have done what this country needs um not based on what you think voters might like based on beating trump you know like uh so that is a it's a really a really smart quote, and um, I heard some some agreement with him in the crowd as well. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's very important, and that's very right. Where the Democrats, I believe, and apparently Mayor Pete believes the same way, and, and other politicians do as well, though some not all, that the Democrats have to come up with their own future vision of the world that is, uh, you know, beyond Trump. It can't just be about beating Trump because Trump is one person. And, of course, there are a lot of things going on that are greater than Trump. And, and so, Democrat, you know, regardless, Mitch McConnell is going to say anything that a Democrat comes up with is evil or stupid or impossible or socialist, right? And so Democrats need to come up with this, a plan that they believe in and make other people believe in it, too, because it's possible. And that's really important. And uh, that kind of, to me, those two clips, Warren retorting against John Delaney and Pete Buttigieg there talking about the need for Democrats to stand up for something beyond what Republicans will think of it. I think that sums up sort of the, the very large theme in the Democratic Party right now of should we be modern? moderate or progressive. This will not case close, of course. We're going to see this come up in the future debates. And it is very interesting. And those two clips, I think, are very important for having us think about what the Democratic Party could or should do. And that is not fall into the so-called moderate trap. I want to now, listeners, on 100.9 FMWXIR, turn our attention to health care. You're, of course, most welcome to participate. 585 219 
5855-219-8889. That's 585-219-8889. Or give us a email, radio, EOD at gmail.com. I want to turn our attention now to healthcare. It, it received most coverage throughout the debate, the longest thing talked about, and it was talked about first on both nights of the debate. Matt, we were just talking a few minutes ago that, you know, watching these debates, it's really hard because you don't really get into the nitty gritty of the issues. And healthcare is one place that you are seeing legitimate differences of the candidates on stage, and that is tied up with very complicated actual substantive issue differences, right? Who is going to pay for Medicare for all? What does Medicare for all mean? Are taxes going to be raised or lowered? Are you going to get rid of private health insurance? How long will this plan take? What will be covered under it? You know, what's going on with Republicans and repealing Obamacare, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Really interesting and lively discussions going on. And remember that even four years ago now, we were not having these discussions thanks to Bernie Sanders and really pushing for the introduction of Medicare for all. Mary, you've brought up that point on past shows where it's like, you know, the Overton window or the dialogue has changed such that it's not really about, hmm, should we have Medicare for all now? Mm -hmm. Now the dialogue is like, how do we make Medicare for all happen? And that's really important, I think. And so, Matt, I want to turn it back to you here. And there were a number of questions that came up in the debate, and some of the politicians sort of uh, <laughs> answered it more directly than others. But a question that kept coming up was, are you going to raise m taxes on the middle class to pay for universal health care. So Matt, I, I sort of ask you a double question. You know, what do you think about that? How do you think the politicians, do they do a good job answering whether or not they should raise taxes on the middle class to pay for health care? Or is there something wrong with the question to begin with? Well, I mean, I, I personally found that, that uh, the way that question was asked was misleading. The the it was it was up front it was very up front and uh, Jake Tapper kind of just went down the line with a number of people and Bernie Sanders Elizabeth Warren um, people to judge a few others and said will you raise taxes on the middle class in order to help pay for Medicare for all and most people didn't really um, give a straightforward answer and I think that. And I know that some people might have been frustrated by that, but in this case, I thought that it was appropriate because if people hear, yes, I'm going to raise taxes on the on the middle class in order to help pay for Medicare, I think the the instinctual re reaction is, oh no, I'm going to be paying even more for for my health care uh, under this new plan. But the idea behind it, as uh, I mean, ideally would be that. People are, yes, people are paying more in taxes for health care, but they're not paying anything, or, or very little at least, in terms of deductibles and co-pays and prescriptions. And so the idea is that even though you might pay more in taxes, overall you're paying less, a lot less, hopefully, for the cost of being healthy. Hmm. I think one thing to bring up there, too, is um, that there are a lot of programs currently that our taxes already go to that provide health care assistance and, you know, having Medicare for all would, you know, we wouldn't have our taxes going to those programs because they wouldn't be necessary anymore. Um, so the amount that it would actually be raised is debatable. Um, and so I like, I don't know offhand what it would be. Um, but I think there would be some element of just shifting where tax funding goes and not fully just, you know, we have this many more taxes added on that are going to pay for this. Like we have to think about the programs that our taxes are already going to mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. And Matt, I agree with that, that question and thank you for bringing that up. It really sort of stretched my thinking on this. I think that that question is problematic. My initial response was that I was, I was sort of angry that the politicians like, you know, Bernie, Bernie Sanders has said in the past debates that yes, taxes on the middle class would be raised to pay for Medicare for all or healthcare for all this debate you know, Elizabeth Warren kind of punted, and Pete Buttigieg tried to reframe the question just like you did, Matt. And I was initially frustrated because I think we should be in a political environment where, where it is okay to say you're going to raise taxes on people. I, and I want to say that, and I think it needs to be important to say that we need to live in a society where it's okay to raise taxes. It hasn't been done forever. Basically, the mantra is you always need to perpetually cut taxes. That is simply not possible to perpetually cut 
taxes, especially as we're running historic levels of deficit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the point is, you know, we can raise taxes. We can get to a society where we can raise taxes and not and really burden other people because we're expanding social safety nets such that you won't have to spend some of your income or money on other programs and services, which will now become guaranteed or free or at least paid through your taxes by the government. And that's really important to think about that debate. And so I agree, Matt, that like we, we can't sort of be t just caught up. I'm sorry. So I'm sort of rambling. My two points are this. One, it should be okay to say that you're going to raise taxes. Two, we shouldn't be caught up with the black or white world of thinking that raising taxes is inherently bad because issues are very complicated, such as healthcare, where the arguments coming out of folks like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and maybe even Pete Buttigieg is that you can raise taxes, but you're going to be saving money overall because you'll be spending less money to no money on health insurance once it goes away, at least through private companies, without your premiums, deductibles, and copays, et cetera. I think an, another interesting piece of that question is the use specifically of the middle class. I know we've mm -hmm. talked on a lot of episodes of like, what is class and what does that mean? And I think phrasing it specifically, not just not as the question, will you raise taxes, question mark, but will you raise taxes on the middle class makes it much more of a controversial question because as we've, you know, again, mentioned on the show before, uh, there is this narrative in the media and in general that everyone in America is middle class or should be. And so that question is really like makes everyone feel like, oh, this would affect me personally even more somehow, even more than would you raise taxes? Mm -hmm. That's a great point, too. And I want to turn now to another clip from the debate. This time it's from our own Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. It's a little longer than a minute, this clip, and I think it sums up kind of at least a position of the folks on stage who talk about a problem with health care being tied to a for-profit system. So there's kind of two camps. You know, we have the more moderates like John Delaney, Steve Bullock, John Hickenlooper, Joe Biden, who say like, you know... Right, Michael Bennett, et cetera, who say like, look, it's you know, it's okay to still have private corporate, uh, private health insurance, and then there's sort of like a, a, a an equally sized sort of more progressive wing, but a, a very much smaller size, like only really Bernie Sanders and Kamala Harris, although she's walked it back a little bit, have said like, yeah, let's blow up the private health care system, get rid of it. You know, I, I'm not sure where Elizabeth Warren stands on that actually, but Kirsten Gillibrand, I think, would sort of fall somewhere into that more progressive lens here. And let's listen to this longer clip of her talking about her stance on health care from the second night of the second 2020 Democratic presidential primary debates. I think for the viewers in the audience right now, they're at risk of losing the forest through the trees, because the truth is, healthcare in America should be a right. When I was a young mother and had Theo as an infant, he had an allergic reaction to eggs and his whole body turned red and puffy. I had to rush him to the emergency room. My heart is palpitating because I'm worried that his throat will close. I am not worried about not having an insurance card or a credit card in my wallet. I know whatever they're going to prescribe, whether it's an EpiPen or an inhaler, I can afford it. The truth about healthcare in America today is people can't afford it. They cannot afford it. And the insurance companies for these plans that rely on insurance companies, I'm sorry, they're for-profit companies. They have an obligation to their shareholders. They pay their CEO millions of dollars. They have to have quarterly profits. They have fat in the system that's real, and it should be going to health care. So let's not lose the forest for the trees. And last, let's not forget what the Republicans are doing. Because the truth is, the Republicans and Trump, their whole goal is to take away your health care. Thank you. To make it harder for you to afford it, Thank even you, if you have pre-existing conditions. Senator Harris, your response. So again, that was New York Senator Kirsten Gillibrand with a, with a lengthy quote there talking about her stance on health care. I thought that was a, a pretty good way to sum up at least one of the stances on the Democratic debate now about what do we do about health care. And that stance is like, look, companies, they're for profit. It is skewing the health care system for profit as opposed to for health care. That calls back to your favorite quote from the last debate with Mayor Pete saying something like, <laughs> Don't count on the tender mercies of the tender mercies of the corporate system or something. Yeah, you can't account for the uh, you can't count on the tender mercies of the of, of the corporate system. Mayor Pete has clocked in at two of my favorite quotes in these past debates, man. Yeah, I didn't realize that. I did. 
Well, that is. Well, listeners, you are most welcome again to participate in these discussions as we, as we talk about the Democratic presidential primary debates. 585-219-8889. Again, that's 585-219-8889. We'd love to hear from you. You're most welcome to call in. Do not be shy. Your voice matters. It was interesting to hear Matt also and Mary from other uh, of the more moderate wing uh, of the Democratic Party on stage. They used, Steve Bullock in particular used a phrase called wish list economics and John Delaney used a phrase called fairy tale economics. Very interesting to hear them invoke that language to say that the, the policies that are being proposed by some of the more progressive candidates who push for things like Medicare for all are simply based on economics that do not matter or sorry, that, that are simply unrealistic. I was very shocked to hear wish list economics and fairy tale economics. That's very damaging and harmful, I think, to the larger goal of creating a more sort of a um, just society, especially when, and here, and here's my worry. We've talked about it before on the show. Like th- there, I don't know what number of people out there, but for those who are Trump supporters, I think there are very, uh, there's a considerable amount of Trump supporters who vote for Trump in spite of all the things he says, because of the notion that the economy is doing well or whatever. And so I think it's very harmful for us as a society to talk about what works economically and what doesn't work economically, because we sort of have this very conservative idea behind the economy and economics. When the economy is working or what is economically possible, it tends to be very conservative in terms of like, the economy only allows certain realities to come true. I think that those two quotes or the the phrases, the wish list economics or um I'm sorry, what was it again? Wish list and fairy tale economics. And fairy tale economics. Um also really ignore the fact that these systems do exist and do work in other nations that are not so, you know, otherwise like maybe have populations that aren't so different than ours. Mm. And so calling them that totally ignores the fact that these do exist and do work in other places. Mm. My favorite example of that is, um, I can't remember where this took place exactly. It was earlier this year, I think at some business summit and, um, uh, the, the CEO of Dell was asked a question about what he support, uh, uh, AOC's tax plan, and he was very dismissive of it. He was like, uh, "I can't even remember the details of her of her plan." Yeah. But um, he said, "Like, name one country where that's ever worked," and the reporter was like, "The U.S." <laughs> you know, we had a uh, we had like a a seventy percent tax on the the highest income earners throughout much of the nation's history until the seventies. And it's like it, when uh, when the the people. When people like the CEO of Dell, like Mitch McConnell, like these wealthy uh, entre- entrepreneurs and businessmen and corporate talk pieces and Republican con- candidates control the narrative, then they will they will uh, ensure that only what benefits them appears possible. Mm-hmm. I think that's a great point too. Yeah, there's. <laughs> The, yes, there's either uh, simply, I always struggle with thinking about like, is there a simple ignorance about history where people don't know that, you know, top marginal tax rates were in excess of 70%, whereas nowadays they're, you know, sub 35%. I don't think tax rates are what we learn about in high school history Probably or not. what we listen to rather. Yes. <laughs> yes. And we've talked about we talked about them before, you know. So do people either not know that, like the the CEO of Dell, or does he know that and he's just trying to swing the narrative by talking about stuff like fairy tale economics and wishless economics? I'm not sure, you know. One is insidious because it's purposeful manipulation, manipulation, and the other is sort of you know just just ignorance. And so uh, ignorance can be educated, but manipulation um, it has to be fought. And, and that that's pretty hard, you know. And so there, there's two other issues that maybe with our remaining time we can talk about, and those are climate change and immigration. Unless listeners, you'd like to give us a ring five eight five two one nine eight 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 nine five eight five two one nine eight 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 nine. If it's your first time calling into a radio show, don't 
B. Worried and nervous about introducing someone if they're talking. The nature of radio is such that when you call in, you're going to be hearing people talk as you're dialing. Don't worry about it because we will stop or pause our conversation at a convenient time to put you on air. So don't feel like you're interrupting uh, unless you're bringing up something that simply has nothing to do with what we're talking about. You're welcome to share. 585-219-8889. Let's talk about climate change here. <laughs> Let's talk about climate change. I, I'm a little worried about the, the climate. I don't know about you folks. I think June was the hottest record uh, in the history of records. <laughs> and um, Hottest record. <laughs> the hottest month ever, you know, in the history of the world. On record. On record. Um, yeah, right. Not in the history of the world, but, you know, on record. And I, I think that, what, is July slated to beat that? I, I'm not sure. I believe so. Um, yeah. And so we have sort of, you know, climate change comes up as like the fifth or the sixth issue, and then it's not really talked about that much. And then, you know, every report... Jay Inslee is just fuming. <laughs> seething. Fuming. <laughs> On the side of the stage. Just like the climate, Matt. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 right, so Jay Inslee is the governor of, of Washington who, who's sort of running on, uh, almost entirely on sort of a, a climate change platform. And, you know, there are some people who are like, no other issue should matter at all. Stop talking about anything besides climate change. Yeah. And, you know, and, and the more reports come out about it, the, the more it seems like we have Just, less and less time yeah. to do anything about apocalyptic. it. Apocalyptic. Yeah, like like literally apocalyptic. And, I, and I'm pretty worried about it. Um, and so I guess I'm bringing this up not to bring up any larger point besides the fact that, like, I, I'm a little scared, you know, and I don't I don't see any folks on stage. You know, I don't know. I'm, I'm happy. I'm not saying that I that he's, like, even in my top three candidates, but I am happy that there is at least that Jay Inslee is at least running, and that he is hopefully just by his presence making this issue more, I guess, pertinent to mm -hmm. the candidates. In the same way that Bernie was for healthcare in 2016, I hope Jay Inslee is for climate change in 2020. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I, I don't know that I see that catching on as much because I think, again, Bernie has a, a level of X appeal that is in some ways unquantifiable that Jay Inslee, I don't believe has, but you yeah. know, here's hoping. And, and Andrew Yang is doing the same thing for universal basic income, right? Where it's really helpful to have someone talk, you know, whether or not Andrew Yang is electable, whatever you want to use that term as it's very helpful. I think to have someone talk about universal basic income, because again, it changes the so-called Overton window. And that's the, the, the idea that like, um, there's a certain amount of rhetoric allowable in society and sometimes rhetoric becomes more allowable than other times. So for example, now, you know, universal basic income is more allowable as an idea to get people to listen to you. And so too, unfortunately is are things like white nationalism. Yeah, it is slightly, say that. yeah. So the Overton window can be good or bad, you know, and, and that changes over time. Thanks to the, the things that people do and say. Maybe then we can turn to immigration. There's one last clip I want to play. Immigration is a very tricky topic, I think, for Democrats. I was just mm -hmm. going to jump in that sure. immigration actually um, and climate change together. Uh, I mean, just thinking about it, it's going to only become more and more connected mm -hmm. as we have, you know, hotter months on record around the equator and up. We're only going to see more and more people needing to move you know, uh, needing to become climate refugees and move to places that aren't as intensely hot, having as intense storms or underwater um, or underwater. So that is only going to continue, you know, together to be an issue. Right. That, that is a phenomenal point. Thank you. Yeah, that's and and which party is going to come up with the best vision for that? You know, I well, we have <laughs> Democrats who <laughs> yeah, it's like have let them ideas. in or let them drown, and then yeah. we have the Republicans who don't believe anything is happening. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. who neither believe in climate change nor the idea of people who aren't, for the most part, white. You know, yeah. <laughs> to put it bluntly. So uh, let's listen to now uh, the governor of oh, where are you from, Steve Bullock? Where are you from? Is it Montana? The governor of Montana, yes, Montana Governor Steve Bullock. Let's listen to a clip from him, I believe around 40 seconds long, talking about his stance on immigration. Look, I think this is a part of the discussion that shows how often these debates are detached from people's lives. we got got 100,000 people showing up at the border right now. If we decriminalize entry, if we get health care to everyone, we'll have multiples of that. Don't take my word. That was o President Obama's Homeland Security Secretary that said that. The biggest problem right now 
that we have with immigration, it's Donald Trump. He's using immigration to not only rip apart families, but rip apart this country. So that was Montana Governor Steve Bullock. I have about 60 seconds here to make a, a quick point. Yeah. I mean, so so uh, that was a case that a number of people uh, were making where a lot of people, such as uh, Bernie Sanders and um, Julian Castro and a few others spread out between the two nights, were making the case that or saying essentially that they would decriminalize um, crossing the border illegally. And uh, there were a few different ways in which that might happen. Uh, I know Pete Buttigieg brought up that instead of uh, these people who cross the border, border illegally being prosecuted in a criminal case, you would do it in a uh, civil case mm-hmm. manner. I'm not an expert in law, so I don't know what the difference in that is essentially. But um, I, I would assume that uh, a civil case would, if these people are, pr- are prosecuted in a civil case, the idea, the idea is that if you decriminalize crossing the border illegally, you get rid of the legal underpinnings that Donald Trump is using to separate families and put children in cages. Um, uh, there are, then there are people like Steve, uh, like Bullock, um, and a few others who said, we don't need, or Joe Biden, we don't need to decriminalize the, uh, we don't need to decriminalize crossing the border. We just need to get rid of Donald Trump because Donald Trump is the whole reason why this has sort of started to begin with. Yeah. Right. Well said. And that's a problem, I think. So we played Bullock's clip there because I think it's a problem for the Democrats to say that Trump is the problem with immigration. Mary, as you just made a, a very strong point before we played the clip, immigration, if it's a problem now, not just because of Donald Trump, but certainly exacerbated by him, it is only going to become more of a so-called problem in the future thanks to things like climate change. And, and so we need to come up with policies of an immigration system that actually makes sense for the realities of the world that we live in. And so much of the debate, rightfully so, was placed on, um, in terms of immigration, was concerned with how do we stop um, the separation of families. Mm-hmm. And that is something that I, I believe every single... I would hope every single candidate on that stage would end. Um, at the same time, very little time was dedicated to having like a coherent immigration policy. Like, what do you do about people crossing the border illegally who aren't seeking asylum? You know, Bernie Sanders had uh, has said that he will uh, prov- provide free health care and free education to imi- uh, right. to migrants. Um, and, and then we have people like uh, Bullock who are saying, you know, we're going to kick him out. So. Right. We can't just let Donald Trump's uh, travesty dominate the discussion on what needs to be done with immigration. Yes, completely agree. Matt, can we pull up some drama mean here as we phase out the 61st episode of Evidence of Design? So I hope you mean the song because I'm I do not a <laughs> drug dealer. <laughs> no, yeah, we're not not tired just yet. Well, I'm always kind of tired, but you know, <laughs> it's 11:30. So, l- listeners, I hope you do you did enjoy tuning into the 61st episode of Evidence of Design here on 100.9 FM WXIR in Rochester. We can sum up with the second the second round of debates for the 2020 Democratic side of the presidential primaries. There, there, you know, the issues continue to be fleshed out, and Trump is running on two things to become reelected: the strength of the economy and his hardline stance on immigration. And so Democrats need to figure out how to deal with both of those things. Firstly, the strength of the economy is a myth, and people like Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders are pointing that out well, I think. Secondly, immigration Democrats have a lot of work to do on to come up with like an actual immigration plan that is more than just countering Trump and more than just uh, just amnesty. I'm not saying I disagree with personally about amnesty or, or pathways to citizenship, et cetera, for immigrants, but we need to come up with something better because I don't think the majority of Americans are there if you just use that language. We have to define that more as a Democratic Party. So plenty more to come. The third debates are in September. We'll probably be covering them as well. So thank you for tuning in. I was your host, Jason Taylor, this hour. Also joined by my good friends and co-hosts, Matt Treadwell. Goodbye. And Mary Lawrence. Thanks for joining us. The Esquire Hour is up next. And oh my gosh, I have never forgotten. I've, I've always forgotten, in fact. Not never forgotten. They're quite the opposite. I've